Breaking Eagles news is this. Corey Clement has been placed on the injured list, uh, which potentially sounds like, John, is the end of his season. You could designate two to come back. Do you get the feeling, though, that the end of Corey Clement, maybe his tenure with the Eagles, uh, quite frankly, with this news, uh, is coming? Uh, potentially, yeah. There's no question about it. Uh, it behind the scenes, uh, it's it's pretty clear he's not going to be one of the guys that comes back. So uh, this will be it for him this season. Uh, and the word we get is he tried to play through. Remember, he injured it in week two in Atlanta on that kickoff return where he fumbled, uh, and it wasn't responding uh, to their liking, and it just wasn't bouncing back. So uh, the Eagles needed to make a move for a punt returner. That was part of it. Boston Scott comes up because the last thing you want is Nelson Aguilar uh, returning punts on the road. Uh, you don't have Darren Sproles, you don't have Deshaun Jackson, so move needed to be made. And unfortunately, Corey's going to be shut down. Uh, in his place, it looks like Boston's in, uh, it might run right into a pretty interesting role here uh, with the Eagles because Darren Sproles out. We know that they have a need for a returner. Uh, Doug had mentioned Corey's name in that role along with Nelly, Nelson Aguilar, but I guess Boston Scott now might walk right into a role. Yeah, he's going to be the punt returner. He might even be the kickoff returner, to tell you the truth, because Miles Sanders is obviously going to be now in a two-man rotation and running back, so they might not even want him to do that. Uh, so Boston is definitely going to be the punt returner. Uh, he might be the kickoff returner. Uh, and, yeah, that's part of the reason they made this move, because they did not want Nelson Aguilar on the road trying to – uh, haul down punts. They just didn't want that. Uh, that's a disaster waiting to happen. So uh, it was a move that needed to be made, and uh, they pulled the trigger today. John, uh, the word out of Vikings is that Josh Klein, the starting right guard, is out. I believe uh, Dakota Dozier is taking his place, not DJ Dozier Hare. And yeah. uh, I don't know. You look at the Vikings being banged up, and, and they haven't really gotten great play, inconsistent play at best at center with their rookie. And you feel like if the Eagles stop the run and put the Vikings in some second and third and longs, that this is exactly where Jim Schwartz thinks he can win, he can win this game. Yeah, no question. I mean, that's what you want to do. You want to put Kirk Cousins in third and long situations. You want him to hold on to the football in the pocket uh, because he's prone to fumble. Uh, fumbles more than basically any other starting quarterback in the NFL. Uh, over a long span so he's willing to give the football up you got to get him in that type of position there's no question that's a strength for the Eagles versus uh, weakness for the Vikings uh, the offensive line isn't very good when Josh Klein is out there and he's probably their second best offensive lineman so uh, to take a down tick to Dakota Dozier uh, that makes it even worse and this could be a big Fletcher Cox Brandon Graham game. In fact, it has to be. If the Eagles want to win this game, Fletcher Cox and Brandon Graham have to dominate inside on those pass rushing downs. So is it all about the pass rush uh, Sunday, John, or are the Eagles defense going to be taking any opportunities to double? And how do they go about doing that? Who do they, who do they decide to double? I mean, the pass rush or the, I'm sorry, the pass attack for Minnesota hasn't been stifling, but they do have those weapons uh, that can go off at any moment. So, how do you expect Jim Schwartz to call this? Yeah, it, it is. We just talked about the good news. Now, the bad news is you have the Eagles cornerbacks matching up against Adam Thielen and Stephon Dick in, at home in Minnesota on the fast turf. Uh, that is not good, <laughs> um, uh, to be kind. And. It looks like Sidney Jones is going to play, so that's helpful uh, because you can criticize Sidney as much as you want, but he's a heck of a lot better than Craig James. If Craig James uh, had to play in this game, you should be really, really concerned. Um, so it's big to get him back, and he's got to hold up, and we'll see how it is. But and, and it, I, It's going to be which team can mask its major deficiency better. That's who's going to win this game. Can the Vikings figure out a way 
uh, whether it's rolling Kirk Cousins out, they often do that, try to create a little extra time because those receivers are going to get open. Uh, or, uh, as I said, can the Eagles dominate with their front four, uh, just overwhelm that Vikings offensive line and force Kirk Cousins to turn over the football? That's kind of going to be the definition of this game and define who wins it. Hey, John, I want to ask you a little bit more on Sidney Jones because we've talked about him all week and we've even asked you about it. Uh, this is a, We've all talked about this kind of being a put-up or shut-up game for him with what Peterson said, but as someone who spends as much time in the locker room as you do and have gotten to talk to Sidney Jones for the last three years, and I'm really asking for your opinion on this, um, do you feel like what you've seen from Sydney and, and talking with him and getting to know him a little bit is that if, if he doesn't work out, was this a failure in evaluation of talent of, or a failure in evaluation of a, of a player's will, his um, ambition, his determination? I guess that all falls under character, leadership, however you want to talk about it. But is it, can, are you able to write this moment to make a distinction between those two and, and have a feel on – where it's gone wrong for him? Yeah, I mean, I, I think Doug let us in on that earlier this week. I think he admitted it. Uh, he hasn't been uh, tough enough to fight and went uh, further on about that today. And, and veteran players, and he brought up Jason Kelsey and, and Fletcher Cox and Malcolm Jenkins. And it's not only uh, the games, it's practice. Uh, a lot of times you don't feel 100%. You know, everybody Googled Jason Kelsey's injury list from last year. A yeah. uh, guy played through it all. And I, and, and I often say offensive linemen are a little bit of a different beast. Uh, so maybe that's not a fair comparison. But a guy like Malcolm Jenkins is. And, you know, Malcolm's going to do anything to get out there. And never forget about a practice. Guy doesn't miss a play. doesn't uh, anything. Uh, he's not happy with his contract. He's still showing up. He's still playing. And, and that goes uh, for practice as well as games. And that's the reason he's turned into the player he's turned into. We haven't seen that from Sidney Jones yet. He's gotten that uh, sort of uh, a warning from the coaching staff. But to be honest, I, I, I think it might be too late. I, I, I mean, best case scenario, he's going to do better, as I said, than Craig James. He's not going to do well against those receivers. I mean, good corners don't do well against those receivers, to be honest. Uh, Rasul Douglas is playing very well. He's not going to do well against those receivers. They're just not. So, And then you see what's coming down the pike. And is Jalen Mills going to be able to practice next week? It looks like he is. Ronald Darby's getting closer. Avante Maddox is getting closer. Cravon LeBlanc is getting closer. There's going to be a lot of bodies in line to play. And I think Sidney Jones is going to be on the outside looking in, to be honest. Wow. John McMullen, football at four at JF McMullen, of course, covers the Eagles in uh, the NFL for 97.3 ESPN.com. And, John, you know, everybody's talking about they like to run the ball. The Eagles stop the run. The Eagles are the best in the league, 63 a game given up. They're the third best, 166. Is this a game where, you know, you say, this is what we want to do. We don't care how good you are. Do you expect that the Vikings are still going to come out and go right after that Eagles front? In other words, do they think the Eagles run defense is as good as the stats say? Because there's a lot of times, I remember playing Green Bay a couple of weeks ago, and we said, well, their numbers look really good in you know three games in until somebody ran against them and you know, they couldn't stop the run. So do the Vikings think that the Eagles run defense is as good as the numbers say? Uh, I, I, I don't think they think it's quite as good as the numbers say. Because remember, uh, coming into last week, and obviously the Jets kind of skew things, and that's why I'm not a big statistics guy to begin with, but they were 32nd. They were dead last in the league in, in, in pass defense. So you kind of, it's that chicken and the egg we always talk about. Well, it was so easy to throw against them teams uh, they were a little stingy against the run. But while I say that, they're still really good. So I think Minnesota, and, and they've said it all week, they understand this is more than five games. This, is, this team has been very good 
against the run for years now under Jim Schwartz. So they know they're good at it. Now, are they historically good at it, like they're shaping up early in the season? Probably not. Uh, and, and the Vikings think they can get some things done uh, because they have one of the best running backs in football. Uh, but they understand they're not going to run for 166. John, on that level, though, uh, if the Vikings want to you know, commit to the run like they have and come out in 12 and maybe even 13 personnel, do you think we're going to see a lot more two and maybe three linebacker formations responded to by Jim Schwartz? And, and in the case there, I guess that means, if so, a big game for Zach Brown along with Nigel, but maybe even Camus to get more snaps? Yeah, and Nate Carey, throw him in there as well because Nate has performed very well, uh, and I think he's kind of earned himself uh, more playing time. But, yeah, I mean, the Vikings are big. It, the Vikings and Eagles kind of mirror uh, each other right now as uh, Big 12 personnel teams. Vikings, because they don't have a third receiver, their third receiver is a rookie uh, seventh-round pick, B.C. Johnson. Uh, Eagles have to play a lot of 12 personnel because Deshaun Jackson is out. Never since Dallas Goddard has gotten healthy, uh, you've seen that shift back to significant 12 personnel because he's better than Matt Collins or, or J.J. Ortega Whiteside. So it makes sense uh, from both teams' perspective. Irv Smith is, is a really good rookie tight end and a second tight end for the Vikings. Uh, so I think it's a big nickel game for both teams on defense. In Minnesota, that means J. Ron Kurz. Uh, for the Eagles, it means Andrew Sandejo. Uh, so I think it's more going to be in that direction for both defenses. Sure. Yeah, it's Sandejo, as you wrote, singing like a canary, right? Uh, <laughs> he's got the lowdown on what the Eagles are going to see this week. Yeah, and Mike Zimmer, you hear, I mean, the one thing the Eagles coaches say it all the time, and Mike Zimmer said it this week, is how smart Sandejo is as a football player. There's a lot of guys uh, who only learn their position. He's sort of a Malcolm Jenkins type. He knows everybody's role on the defense, uh, and he played in Minnesota for a long time. So he knows exactly uh, what they're trying to accomplish defensively. And Zimmer admitted he's going to have to change some things up uh, because Sandejo knows everything uh, that they do as a longtime starter there. Hey, John, uh, 11 of the 16 teams in the NFC, uh, two or fewer losses. So this is an important game. 134 of 213 teams, that's 62% that go 4-2, and two, make the playoffs. So the winner of this game feels pretty good. 36% if they lose this game. So is this, in your mind, between these two teams, it seemed pretty evenly matched. Is this the separation of which team is a legit and which team is just a pretender? Uh, it, probably from Minnesota standpoint, not necessarily from the Eagles standpoint. I think the difference is because uh, the Vikings are in a more difficult division. Uh, and really all four teams can make an argument that they could run, uh, make a run to the playoffs, whereas in the NFC East, it's, it's a two-horse race. Uh, so uh, I think the Eagles have a little bit more uh, rope for potential uh, hiccup uh, because they still have obviously two games with Dallas on the schedule uh, and if they take care of business in that and in those two games uh, there's really n not going to be any concern when it comes to the NFC East so uh, I don't think it's a must win from the Eagles perspective uh, by any stretch of the imagination the fact that the Vikings have already lost to Green Bay and Chicago. Now, both of those games are on the road, so they get them both at home. But that means there's no, there's absolutely no room uh, for for any hiccups on their part. They have to win both of those games. So it, from their perspective, it's a much more important game. What type of game does this set up for, for an Eagles player on the offensive side of the ball to have a big game? Like, where, where are the mismatches? I know we're talking about run defense and – the Vikings running attack, but on the Eagles offensive side of the ball, what is something that you hope, you know, Doug Peterson 
does or dials up? And is there a specific player in mind? Like, is it a Jordan Howard game? Is he the most important to the offense? Is it a Goddard game or an Ertz game or maybe Aguilar in the slot? Like, how do you see it playing out and any matchups that stand out? Well, it's never an Aguilar game. It's never a Howard game. With <laughs> I threw him a bone uh, for some like, reason. I don't know why. They, they do like uh, Zach Ertz. Uh, they always like Zach, but they specifically like Zach in this game because Minnesota gets very aggressive uh, off uh, defensively, uh, and they think they can use Zach's route running uh, in double moves, and that happened in the NFC Championship game uh, to their advantage. And also, Alshon has had a lot of success against that team dating back to when he was in Chicago. He just seems to have Xavier Rhodes' number. He always has. Uh, so the Eagles like that as well. Uh, the, the issue with Alshon, though, is I, I don't know if he's 100%. In fact, I kind of know he isn't 100%. And he's not running as well as he usually does. Uh, so I, I think if you're looking for one guy, it's probably going to be Zach Ertz because uh, the Vikings typically struggle with tight ends. And Zach's one of the best, arguably the best, uh, pass-catching tight end in football. Hey, John, uh, we saw 10 sacks last week against the Jets. Give us a quick little lowdown on that matchup for us where it looks like there could be uh, – the Vikings could be down an interior alignment. Is this another week? You know, a couple of years ago, I remember Sam Bradford Kate was here. They were 4-0. They looked pretty good. And the Eagles were all over them. That line was just a mess. They've been a mess. Uh, but they've been covering up their mess because they run the ball a lot. But in a game where the Eagles can stop the run, is that maybe where the rubber meets the road? Can they pass protect? Yeah, I mean, I think that's the biggest part from the Vikings' perspective, how much can they pass protect. It's not going to be as ugly as Luke Falk because, I mean, I, I feel like this has been picked on Kirk Cousins' week, but he is a veteran guy. He understands. He's had success uh, against the Eagles. Yeah, he's played very well against the Eagles generally. Uh, and he beat them last year here. Uh, but uh, he, he understands uh, how to uh, call protections. He understands to get people going in the right direction. And he also understands uh, at times you're going to have to speed it up if, if they're not able to pass protect at all. So forget about 10 sacks. That's not happening against a veteran quarterback who, who understands how to play. I, I think the goal from the Eagles' perspective is, is just what I said – he's apt to turn the football over, especially in the pocket. So if you're able to make him hold on to that football, he's going to fumble it. He just does. That's part of what he is as a player. He just fumbles a heck of a lot. So I, I think it's more about that uh, than any huge sack number. I, he's, he's too smart of a quarterback to, to have that happen to him. All right, John, as we uh... – Get ready for the game. We'll get your pick in just a second here. I do want to get uh, one last thing here. We know Deshaun Jackson uh, is out for the game, and the Eagles injury report is official um, out. Corey Clement, Ron Darby, Deshaun Jackson, Timmy Jernigan, Avante Maddox, and Darren Sproles there. You mentioned Boston Scott. Any other uh, surprises you think are going to happen on Sunday with that inactive list? It seems like it's been a pretty straightforward thing. There hasn't been many uh, controversial decisions. Do you think we'll see anything crazy this week? No, I mean, there's so many injuries, you don't have to worry about that. So, I mean, he, you see all the guys rolled out. Now, Clement's already on injured reserve, so he doesn't have to uh, – he's not going to count against that inactive list. But you add in uh, the Nate Herbigs of the world uh, who never dress, and, and you basically understand, and, and Nate Sudfeld, you know, really want to address the third quarterback. So uh, the inactive list has been <laughs> pretty clear cut yes. uh, from once the Eagles have started with these injuries. And that's that's because, hey, you don't have to you don't have to make decisions. They're made for you. All right, John, uh, Eagles Vikings, big one uh, in Minnesota. They're at home. Uh, pl been playing pretty well, beat the Giants. You know, Giants, I thought, fought pretty hard last night uh, in that game. They ended up, you know, losing, uh, didn't cover last night, but it was a close game. They fought hard. So maybe uh, that win by Minnesota was pretty impre uh, was more impressive than maybe we thought. Uh, so what do you think? Philly at Minnesota, how's it go down? 
Yeah, real quick, that Pat Shermer fourth and two. What an awful decision. Oh, my on God. The there, but, that was the most shermer uh, decision ever. Yeah, I, I mean, I like that, but that's just a disaster. Uh, but, yeah, I, I mean, I've been going back and forth. This is such, to me, a nip and tuck game. It can go either way. I could see Brandon Graham wrecking this game. I could see Adam Seelan wrecking this game from an Eagles perspective uh, in a negative fashion. Uh, ultimately, I, I, I think people are forgetting what's up next for the Eagles, and that's the Dallas Cowboys. And already there's this shift towards let's get people ready for Dallas. And I think people kind of forget because of the NFC Championship game and all that hubbubaloo that went on between the fan bases. Look, the Vikings care about the Packers. The Eagles care about the Cowboys. That's what each team cares about. And I think the Eagles are going to be looking ahead a little bit, and I think that shifts and tilts the game towards Minnesota. I have the Vikings winning 27-23. All right, Johnny Mac goes 27-23 Vikings. And uh, I think Sal Powell was 27-23 Philadelphia. So we've got same score, different winner from NFL insiders John McMullen and, of course, Sal Powell Antonio on this edition of the Sports Bash. We'll have our picks later on in the show. Stick around for that. Johnny Mac is back on Saturday with Pete and Sunday on the Countdown to Kickoff show with Tony Bruno. Hopefully Tony's out of bed. He was all laid up last night, uh, but he fought hard for the Countdown to Kickoff show. Did it from his bed. Uh, but you can hear John and the crew. Countdown to Kickoff starts at 10 o'clock from Tollman Joe's. Not the Wildwood version, the South Philly version. And uh, we're here live at the Barefoot Beach Bar in Cape May. John, appreciate it, pal. All right. Thank you, guys. And John McBone, like all guests, appear via the Boardwalk Honda hotline.